in today's chapter, um, it'll be sort of a very broad overview of what we'll be doing in the future. Um, so that's why it's called general guidelines, sort of just to whet your appetite. Um, I guess reading this isn't necessary because it's sort of just a preview for everything we'll be doing later. But at the same time, I think this chapter has a lot of helpful resources um, that I'll link at the end. Um, that'll be helpful for us as we um, become better programmers and build more shiny apps. So we've, I would say we've gotten through a lot of the hard stuff already, especially when it comes to, you know, the reactive graph and understanding the logic behind it among all the other components we covered um, throughout these weeks. Um, but this chapter and the following chapters will sort of talk about how to scale better. In, in particular, how to scale from smaller to bigger apps as we move to possibly bigger teams and more production grade apps where we'll have more users. So we'll start to think about organization. So how we can uh, better organize our code so we don't find ourselves in situations where we can't find certain code in a huge file um, to look at improved stability. So if, you've worked, if you haven't worked on code in six months to be able to go back to it and not being afraid of breaking it if you're to make small tweaks or changes and then maintainability. So the app works on my computer, um, but also works on uh, my collaborators' computers and to make sure it works in production as well. So for the first part, we'll discuss um, best practices. And this chapter, and again, the following ones, um, there will be much more of an emphasis on software engineers. Um, if you're like myself, um, a lot of our users come from more of a statistics and applied sciences background and not programming. So I think this will be a nice primer or introduction into better software engineering practices. So we'll, um, in subsequent chapters, talk about things like decomposition, so decomposing things into functions to avoid repetition, as well as into modules. So these are ways that um, will help us compartmentalize our Shiny app to make it, um, one, the code more readable, but also um, more functional. Um, but again, we'll discuss that in later chapters. Um, and then organization. So something I never considered when it makes sense to put your Shiny app into an R package, and then stability, which is a very important section we'll, where we'll discuss all the types of testing. The next is another section that I never gave much thought to, which is security. So not only securing your data, but also your computing resources. So it is possible for people to hack into your server and then use your computing resources. So being mindful of that that's a possibility and how to prevent that. Lastly, we're going to talk more about performance, so ways to identify and resolve bottlenecks um, within different parts of your app. Um, it'd be nice if Ryan was here. I feel like he has thoughts on a lot of this stuff, but um, maybe he can comment after. And if you have any thoughts, feel free to jump in. Okay, so software engineering can be kind of summarized within uh, this simple diagram where this is the first stage you might start at, which is, I don't understand it. Then you might move to a stage where you still need the docs, and then hopefully you'll be able to understand uh, your code fluently. Um, Hadley, the author, recommends to set aside some time each week to practice software development, specifically for your Shiny apps. So this involves focusing on making your app easier to understand and develop. So it doesn't necessarily mean um, adding new features, or trying out new packages and adding it to your Shiny app, but just making sure that your code is clean and readable and making sure that you're trying to optimize what you have currently. Next is code organization. So I like the quotation that they pulled here from Martin Fowler. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. So the first section starts with, having empathy, or this is another way of saying, trying to think about it from other people's perspectives or putting yourself in the shoes of another. So uh, think about how they'll interact with your code in the future. Um, are the variable and function names clear and concise? If not, what names would be better? Um, again, probably principles that we've all covered before, especially if you're in other book clubs, but things like um, naming your variable data frame, 
um, versus being specific about the data set that it's referring to. And asking yourself, do I have comments where needed to explain complex bits of code? Um, I was just working on yesterday, or not working, really taking someone else's code where, you know, every time you install a new version of R, you want to save the packages that you already have installed on your previous version. That way it's easier to upload um, on a new version of R. And so I have a small script. This is just a snippet of it. Um, but I realized, especially for things like when you're subsetting, um, this is pretty unreadable. And um, if you're to look at it, it's hard to um, exactly put in words um, what exactly it's doing. So here, either using a pipe operator to make things cleaner or to heavily comment it would help. And that's just one example I found from my own code. I'm sure we can all find it in our own. And then asking other questions like, does this whole function fit on my screen or could it be printed on a single piece of paper? If not, is there a way to break it up into smaller pieces? Um, and am I copying and pasting the same block of code many times throughout my app? If so, is there a way to use a function or variable to avoid repetition? And are all parts of my application tangled together or can I manage the different components of my application in isolation? And we'll discuss functions and shiny modules to address some of or two of these questions um, that are highlighted here. All right, so the next section is testing. Um, again, what we'll actually cover in depth in a future chapter, but just to give an overview, um, a test plan is a script to follow to check if your code is working as intended. Um, tests can be manual. So for example, if I were to create a function that multiplies things, I could check it myself, I guess, by inputting two different numerical values and seeing if the output comes out as intended. However, there are a lot of automated testing options. Um, specifically, there are automated testing options developed specifically for Shiny. And so we'll discuss what all of these tests mean. So unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, and load tests, which see how much traffic your app can withstand. Um, don't ask me yet what exactly all of these tests do because um, we'll learn that together um, in the future. But we'll also learn about things like why does testing improve stability of an app? Um, look for situations where your code breaks or doesn't behave correctly. Um, we'll also learn about the distinction between testing behavior versus testing components of your app. Um, and maybe just to take a second to ask yourself, um, if you already have an understanding of tests and what they are, um, can you have too many tests and can you have the wrong kinds of tests? Um, and if you can't clearly answer these questions for your app, then um, it's a good idea to join our book club. Um, are there any questions so far? I think we're about halfway through already. Yes, I think I have, the comments I have was for the previous section that was talking about code readability. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there I, I can just say maybe uh, we know we have to, in programming we have to we have the best R and also the tidy verse. So here I can just say maybe the best R code we are written for like the machine to understand because as we women, uh, readability of code is, is key and that is being addressed uh, in, with the tidy verse because with the tidy verse syntax. Uh, the readability of code because it make everything readable in which you can easily present your code to anybody and the person will really understand the workflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point and I agree. Um, that's the purpose as you already mentioned of why the Tidyverse was created. And to build on that, um, I believe the Tidyverse team has sort of a mini book or manual on how on the best coding principles working within the tidyverse right so there are many good resources out there already i just haven't utilized it yet um, to say make codes like this where you're subsetting multiple times much more readable um, so yeah it's a good point um, one thing to be aware of i guess is that at least at one point when the tidyverse was constantly evolving like you probably know there are a bunch of functions that were being deprecated or superseded um, so for some people, it's kind of frustrating to maybe use a function like spread, but then it was replaced by pivot wider. Um, so having to keep up with that is an additional layer with the tidyverse compared to just using base R code. Um, but I do agree that in general, it's much more readable. So 
sort of the benefits outweigh the cons. Um, yeah. That's a good point. Um, and speaking of um, functions being deprecated and superseded, actually, we'll get into dependency management, which sort of touches on this topic. So it's a good segue. Um, so a dependency is anything beyond the source code that your app needs to run. Um, and the authors, and I think the, our community is quickly moving towards RenV or the reproducible R environments package. That's sort of the gold standard um, for helping with uh, dependency management. I believe the package before this was called PackRat, but this is sort of um, the successor of it um, that allows you to manage your package dependencies. So it captures the package versions your app uses so that when you use the app on another computer, you can also use the same package versions. Um, and what this does for your Shiny apps is it protects them from version changes over time. Um, so just trying to think of an example, um, maybe with the tidyverse, um, if there's a function that's eventually deprecated um, and you have your Shiny app, if you're to use um, the RenV package, you could still maintain um, the original um, tidyverse function um, before it was um, deprecated um, and it'll still work on your app, um, if that makes sense. And what it also allows you to do, and I'll link, um, I'll link to the website later of the RenV package is that sort of allows you to create snapshots of your previous working environments as well. Um, so it allows you to sort of go back to previous versions um, of your working environment um, so that to ensure reproducibility. So the next uh, for dependency management is the config package, um, except it doesn't manage package dependencies directly. Rather, it allows you to track and manage dependencies outside of our packages. So for example, um, it creates a, what we call a config file and it allows you to keep track, for example, of the path you specify for a CSV file, right? So it helps you keep organized in that sense. Um, and I think the biggest use of it, especially within um, Shiny apps is that it allows you to configure different environments, um, specifically the production, the test, and the development. And with the production environment, it allows you to create a separate production environment in which you can connect the app to the real production database. Um, then there's the test environment in which you can configure the app to use a test database. So that way you don't risk corrupting your production database if you accidentally, you know, you're experimenting with the app and you make a change that could possibly corrupt the data. So you want to isolate the environments in that case. And then you could also create a development environment. So you might configure this app so that a small CSV is used instead or a smaller subset of data to allow for faster iterating. So let's say you're just, you just wanna test and see if your app works and whether certain functions work. Um, you can do this much faster if you're to just use maybe a few um, data points rather than millions or uh, tens of thousands. Um, was that clear? I feel like I didn't touch on or I didn't do justice for the RenV package, but again, I'll link to the website which will explain it better. I think the only one is, is still for package management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me see what I, yeah. So I have a lot of links. I'll, I'll make sure to put them in the chat later um, at the end of this. But for now, we'll move on to source code management. So again, probably something we're all familiar with, but version control is very important. That way you can track changes, roll back to previous work, and also collaborate with others. So the most popular platform, especially with R, um, is Git, um, which is paired with GitHub usually. Um, and it makes it easy to share your repositories or repos with others. And I would recommend, um, or everyone tends to recommend um, this book slash um, workshop that um, goes through uh, that hyperlink isn't working, but anyways, it sort of gives you a primer of um, how to use Git and integrate it with R, and specifically R Studio. So where was I? Um, okay. 
So for the next section, we'll talk about continuous integration and development or deployment rather. So continuous integration or CI is a way to perpetually or constantly validate the changes you're making to your app. Um, so, um, and it makes sure you haven't broken anything. Um, you can use it to retroactively, so to notify you if a change you just made broke your app application or proactively. So it'll notify you if a proposed change is gonna break your app. And this is an image of what it could look like. So when you're doing CI, you'll run through these checks. And as we can see from this image, all the checks are successful. Um, so they're okay to um, integrate these changes into their app. Um, and the book club is an example of continuous deployment. Um, so this is where we're constantly updating it based on new cohorts that come in and update or change the notes and things like that um, via um, GitHub. And depending on where your code is hosted, you can consider um, all of these options for continuous deployment. So GitHub Actions, Travis CI, Azure Pipelines. Um, personally, I've only used GitHub Actions a bit. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any experience with any of these others, but um, feel free to jump in if, if there are any strong views or preferences for one over the other. So may I ask, uh, mm -hmm. based on the GitHub action, so may I ask what do you use to, is it they use this package you use to configure the GitHub action on your GitHub page or how do you go about it? Yeah, um, so it's been a while. Let me just, I think. Um, so it, it's, it's a platform, like it integrates pretty well with GitHub and so, um, it just creates a nice workflow. Um, let me see if I can pull an example. Um, when working with others, um, I only used it very briefly, um, but it's, I would say it's beneficial in allowing you to um, communicate with others, um, especially when submitting your changes. Um, but yeah, for a lot of these things, and why I'll attach the links later is, um, I think it's just easier once you um, actually use it yourself or run through it. Um, and I'm just scrolling through to see if there's a nice visual for how it all works. Um, I guess this sort of um, touches on it, build, test, and publish. Um, I know that's a very high level thing and maybe a concrete example would be more helpful, um, but definitely recommend checking it out. Because I know there is a function from the use this, which says use on the use GitHub action from use this package. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, yeah, with the use this package, you can use that um, like to specify things like um, your GitHub account and what you're using. Um, yeah. I can't say, I, I won't comment on it further just because. I can't say I'm the most familiar with it, just having used it a while ago <laughs> once. Um, but yeah, you're right that the use of this package does create that interface that allows you to do some of these things that um, Git and GitHub Actions um, does as well. So yeah. Okay, so for the last section is code reviews. Um, something I have little experience with, so I'll definitely look to um, gain more um, gain more experience with as time goes on. But really, um, looking over someone else's code and then providing comments um, and possible requests for change. Um, so it offers teaching opportunities. So programmers at all levels often learn something new by reviewing others' code um, or having their own code reviewed. And um, the resulting conversation often improves the readability of code. Um, so there are many resources um, that are linked to later in this chapter that talk about what are the best um, processes and procedures for reviewing code, um, the best um, etiquette, because I guess review can get sometimes um, nasty or um, maybe not the most productive. So you want to ask, Things like, do new functions have concise but evocative names? In other words, 
um, short but clear names? Um, are there parts of the code that you find confusing? Um, what areas are likely to change in the future and would particularly benefit from automated testing? And does the style of the code match the rest of the app? For example, how you name variables, if it's through camel case or using underscores, is that consistent? Um, how much white space you have? Um, all of these things make for better readability. I would say these are more minor things, but just an example of um, having code style that matches uh, throughout the document. Um, is everyone familiar with what I'm talking about when I say like a camel case or like naming? Um, okay, cool. Um, and also more benefits of code reviews. I guess it's a bit redundant to go over this. I'm sort of preaching to the converted. We probably all acknowledge code review is important. I guess the hard part is actually finding reviewers and what if you're asked to review actually how to do it. Um, so again, the chapter provides some resources on how to best go about that. Um, not necessarily finding reviewers. I guess you have to do that within your team or um, maybe, you know, if you were to have a public repo, that makes it easier. Um, but um, it speeds up learning. And especially if you tried contributing to an R package, um, you really realize how much you don't know. Um, and then things we can ask ourselves are tricks to speed up code review, especially as we get into it more. Um, and who should review who? Um, as well as um, things that are not productive um, to code review. Um, in other words, code review anti-patterns. Um, so maybe not making the most helpful comments or um, sometimes code doesn't necessarily have to be perfect, but it just has to be an improvement. And so recognizing things like that. Um, so as I said, ton of links um, from this chapter. I would say those are, that's where the value of this chapter comes from, which is, um, making sure you're familiar with things like Git and GitHub and the RenV package. So um, I'll, there we go. Put all of these in the chat. Um, even though I feel like some of these can be not whole book clubs, but can take at least a week or so to go through yourself. Um, I would say they're worth the investment um, as we go forward with the rest of this chapter. Um, just because they're very important for um, reproducible workflows and um, scaling your Shiny app. And so I've only linked these three for now. I think these are the most important, um, again, my opinion, but um, there are many more links throughout the chapter. Actually, I have the chapter up where, for example, at the end, um, there are more detailed um, pages on how to do better code reviews and all of that. Um, so hopefully it isn't disappointing that I sort of gave additional homework if you haven't been through these resources already, but I think it'll be helpful. Um, and yeah, that's all I have for today. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Hi, Brendan. Hi, Olu. Uh, thank you so much for leading the chapter. Yeah, I, I just joined in as you are about to uh, finish. Um, yeah, I, I found this topic to be quite self-explanatory, like uh, some of the questions that you may be having regarding. Um, uh, so for example, for me, what I had is the dependency management because I, I knew I tend to repeat codes, which isn't like the best, uh, but I so look forward to chapter 18 about functions. So yeah, <laughs> hmm. yeah, but uh, yeah, thank you. I, I will catch the, I will watch the recording um, once it's out for the part that I missed, yes. All right, that sounds good. Um, yeah, and as you mentioned, this is sort of a chapter to sort of wet your beak or get you, try to get you excited for the future chapters. So hopefully we'll cover a lot of those things like dependency management and functions in more detail um, mm -hmm. later. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, if there's nothing else to add, um, it's great seeing both of you again. Um, have we figured out who's doing the next chapter for next week? Yeah, for chapter 18 functions, I, I, I'll be leading that. I, I, I want to really improve on writing functions. So I took that as a challenge. All right, sounds good. Looking yeah. forward to it. Okay, I, and then I, I think we can stop here and meet again next week. Mm-hmm.
yeah, it seems that going forward will just be the three of us, but either way, anyone is welcome to join. All right. Okay, bye, enjoy your day. All right, thanks everyone, bye. Okay, bye.